Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to today's Commonwealth Club presentation. My name is Dr. Patrick O'Reilly. I'm chair of the Psychology Forum at the Commonwealth Club, and I will be the moderator today. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Michael Smith, who is the director of the Refuge Refugee Rights Program at the East Bay Sanctuary Covenant in Berkeley, California. His background is in anthropology and archaeology. In 1984, he began to work at East Bay Sanctuary, and he's been there ever since. He has received awards from Helen Bamber and the Dalai Lama for his work with refugees and for, for Berkeley Law for his work with law students. If you have any questions for Mr. Smith, please use the text chat feature and as time allows, Mr. Smith will answer your questions at the conclusion of his presentation. So um, without further ado, please welcome Mr. Michael Smith. Um, first, let me fill you in about my work. I'm the director of the Refugee Rights Program at the East Bay Sanctuary, as Patrick said. Um, the title sounds impressive, as it was meant to be. Back in the 1980s, my colleague, Sister Maureen, and I wrote letters to immigration officials and judges to get refugees out of detention centers on the border. And we decided the letters would sound more impressive if we had titles under our signatures. Um, so we invented some. She became the director and I was the assistant director. And then to keep up with corporate America, she became the CEO and I the director of the Refugee Rights Program. People might be impressed by these titles, but when they see our offices in the basement of an early Christian church building in Berkeley, our titles lose some, some luster. I call our office by more descriptive terms the manicomio or the loquero, that means some asylum or the nuthouse. Um, Pre-pandemic, we were the only immigration nonprofit in the Bay Area that took drop-ins on a regular basis. And our waiting room was often filled with clients and children. Walking across that room was sometimes problematic because you didn't want to step on a child or on one of the many toys that lived on the floor. Um, we have a little nook where we tried to keep the toys, but somehow they always managed to cross that border, as did the refugees. Our not in the least attractive offices have expanded. Back in the 1980s, we shared the basement with Project Open Hand, but unfortunately, the clientele for both agencies expanded greatly, and Open Hand moved to bigger and better digs, but we now occupy the entire basement. Small and dingy though we are, we have one of the largest affirmative asylum programs in the country. We began that program in 1992 and have filed over 5,000 cases with a grant rate of 97.5% for adjudicated cases. Because of our success in that field, we were asked to be plaintiffs in two lawsuits against the previous administration, EBSC v. Trump, and the BSC bar. The Make America White Again administration was trying to eliminate asylum for people of color. A number of other agencies joined us, and um, we were represented by the ACLU, and we succeeded in getting those rule changes in joint. Um, and although it used to be a term of derision um, among many people, I am proud to say that I am a card-carrying member of the ACLU. We are a full service immigration office and have 1,000 DACA and 700 TPS clients. We used to have 1,000 TPS clients, but that program began in 2000 and many have since moved on. DACA is the Dreamers program um, begun by Obama and TPS or temporary protective status um, was begun during the Bush administration. We also have a large residency and naturalization program. At a guess, we have 5,000 active files. The Refugee Rights Program deals with the clients, visa vis their immigration status. Um, from the old days, when it was just Sister Marine and me, we have grown to around 20 attorneys and paralegals in the program. And we could not 
successfully represent or assist as many clients as we do without the help of volunteers. I estimate through the years, we've had about 3,000 undergrad volunteers. Um, we're right across the street from Cal Berkeley, which is very handy. Um, and nearly 1,000 law student volunteers and several hundred um, volunteer attorneys. Outsiders might be deluded into thinking because of my impressive title that I coordinate and direct um, the, the chaos at the Monofomio. But the staff, until very recently, all women, except for me, they generally ignore me when they're not abusing me. We are not a top-down organization, more a bottom-up organization. And I got into this racket because of my extensive criminal history. I had lived and worked in Central America in the 1970s. And when the terrible civil wars erupted um, soon after Reagan was elected, I participated in a number of demonstrations against U.S. support for those truly evil regimes in what is now called the Northern Triangle. Um, several times I was arrested with one of the coordinators of the East Bay Sanctuary. Well, there's nothing much you can talk about when you're being held in an underground parking lot or a jail cell. And she talked me into volunteering as a translator. At the demonstrations, I often felt I was with the kind of people I wanted to be with, on the side I wanted to be on. Um, I felt even more so at the sanctuary. I am not religious, but many good religious people were dying in El Salvador and Guatemala, and I wanted to work with those kinds of people. Working with the refugees is rewarding and addictive, and well, I've been hooked for about 35 years. Um, Beginning in the early 1980s, refugees fleeing the terrible um, violence in the, southern, in the Northern Triangle um, began arriving in, in the United States. At first, the vast majority were from El Salvador, while only a trickle came from Guatemala and Honduras. Many of the indigenous Guatemalans who came were uneducated and sometimes did not know they were coming to the United States only that they were being taken somewhere safe to some big place called the other side. Um, Guatemala has the largest population of indigenous peoples in Central America. El Salvador, in a prior act of genocide, eliminated a large portion of its indigenous population during the Matanza in the 1930s, after which many indigenous people found it more convenient to stop identifying as indigenous. During the height of the most recent genocide in the Americas, um, which occurred in Guatemala in the early, early 1980s, some 200,000 people were killed, another 200,000 fled to Mexico, and about 50,000 were disappeared. An estimated 83% of the victims were Maya. These figures are from the Guatemalan uh, the Commission for Historical Clarification, which is the Guatemalan Truth Commission. Um, I have also read that over a million people um, either fled the country or were internally displaced. There can be no precise figures for the devastation of the Guatemalan Holocaust. Um, for a little perspective, let's compare Guatemala with the state of Tennessee. They are the same size as far as land goes. But in 1980, Guatemala had a population of a little over 6.8 million. Um, while Tennessee had 4.6 million. Guatemala lost about 15% of its population in the genocide. That would come to about 750,000 Tennesseans, or everyone in Memphis and a third of Nashville. Tennesseans were devastated recently when they lost over 12,000 people during the coronavirus pandemic. Population figures from countries such as Guatemala with many remote and isolated communities involves some guesswork. Especially half a century ago, when estimates were that the indigenous population made up as much as 60% of the population. Most estimates today are in the range of about 43%. Perhaps mass murder and forced flight, as well as pressure to stop identifying as indigenous might account for much of that decrease. 
Well, little by little, many of the displaced came to the United States. Um, here's a little known fact, also involving guesswork. Um, um, approximately 5,000 Mam Maya live in the East Bay um, of, of San Francisco Bay, um, with a few more and even more expensive West Bay. The sanctuary has some responsibility for this. We have assisted thousands of indigenous Guatemalans in legalizing their status. Um, there are 26 distinct language groups in Guatemala, and some sources say 21. Mom is one of the largest. The Mam Maya live in the western departments of Huevetenango and San Marcos, bordering on Chiapas, Mexico. Also, many Canjobal, Chujoti, and Quiche Maya are in those departments. And um, there are small communities in these groups in the Bay Area and in the Central Valley. In, in fact, indigenous Guatemalans are all over the United States and in the meatpacking plants in the Midwest and in Georgia, in the blueberries in Michigan, in the tomatoes in Florida, in the watermelons in Alabama, in the brocha in Washington. And a number of contractors in, in construction and landscaping have told me that their indigenous workers, um, the Mayan workers, are the best they've ever had. During the Guatemalan genocide, I read an interesting um, and well-researched and cynical article in NACLA, that's the North American Congress from Latin America, about the genocide. While the guerrillas in Guatemala were never numerous nor well-armed enough to um, be a threat to the Guatemalan military, um, the military was concerned um, so what they used the, the guerrillas um, to carry on the repression, very violent repression. They were concerned about revolution, of course, because of what had happened in Nicaragua. And they were concerned about liberation theology then in vogue, which supported uh, the internal struggle for certain rights, such as a living wage. Um, the three Northern Triangle countries were controlled by latifundistas, um, or large landholders or plantation owners. To understand much of the history of Latin America, you have to understand the latifundio system that was imported from Spain with the conquistadores. It is basically a system of large land <coughs> of large landholders um, with large populations of serfs to work the land. I don't want to get into the difference differences and similarities between serfs and slaves. Um, and although I complained to Sister Maureen that I am her slave, um, I'm really more her serf. Um, the serfs were freed in Europe, thanks largely to the plague, and eventually the native populations were freed in the Americas, um, somewhat freed. In the 1930s, debt bondage, um, was abolished in Guatemala, but under a vacancy law, indigenous Guatemalans were required to work either 150 or 100 days a year building the road system, depending on the amount of, of land that they owned. In Guatemala, the large landowners in the South and West grew coffee, cane and coffee on enormous plantations. In the South and West, during harvest season, Thousands of Maya are transported in cattle trucks um, to the fincas of the plantations to harvest crops. 50 years ago, they were paid the equivalent of a dollar a day, but were often cheated out of their salary by non-indigenous supervisors. And also they had to buy necessities such as medicines and salt from company stores. Um, the workers began to organize in one group Cook, um, the Comité de Unidad Campesino, or the Peasants' Unity Community, committee, uh, became large enough to seem threatening to the plantation owners. Um, government negotiators agreed to raise the workers' wages to about $3 a day and one hot meal. But this was intolerable to many plantation owners, and they asked the military to look into the situation. Um, this gets, 
well, I don't want to get too far into this, but if you're interested in the results of the military's investigation, you should search for the Spanish Embassy Massacre, which occurred in 1980. Among the victims in that embassy was the father of Rigoberto Menchu too. Um, although I was brought up not to brag, let me brag for a moment here. Um, Rigoberta, she's the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, as an honor, our former president, um, who shall remain nameless, um, did not win. Um, but as she has given me a couple of warm hugs. She liked to come to our basement offices when she was in Berkeley because she knew there were many Mom Maya, there were many Maya. Um, she's Kiche Maya. Um, enough bragging. And back to the Nakla article. The cynical theory was that the military repression, um, we can read genocide or Holocaust, was meant to terrorize the indigenous and Campesino population sufficiently that they would go back to work for a buck a day and forget about the hot meal, which is what happened. And however, the military had to be careful not to kill so many indigenous people that there would be a short, that there would be a shortage of workers on the plantations. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My job has been an education for me. I've learned about conditions in many countries of the world, and it's been my privilege to work with and interview several thousand Maya in our little basement office and in the refugee camps in Mexico and in Guatemala. And I've testified in immigration court about 20 times as an expert um, on the conditions of the Maya in Guatemala, although I don't like the term expert, but I'd never tell the judges that. Um, um, let me simply say that interviewing indigenous Guatemalans has, been, has educated me in, in the count, countless ways North American Blacks were oppressed in the U.S. after the Civil War and up until today. In immigration court, I compared the current situation for indigenous Guatemalans with that of American Blacks in the Deep South, especially after Reconstruction. Ever since childhood, I knew there was racism, racism in the U.S., but as a white boy, I didn't realize how systemic it was. Interviewing the Maya has opened my eyes, or cleaned the windows of my tour bus. I first went to Guatemala in 1977 after a summer of living and working in the countryside in El Salvador. Not completely blind, I saw the terrible poverty in El Salvador, but didn't get close because I didn't speak Spanish. At the end of that summer, some friends and I traveled for a week or so in Guatemala. We went to the usual tourist spots like Chichi Castanango, also called Gringo Tenango, um, where the big polluting buses unleashed hordes of tourists on the big open air market. Like all the tourists, I was enchanted with the indigenous people in their colorful costumes, especially the women and their bright wipiles, um, those are embroidered blouses and in court days, um, with those are tight wrap around skirts. Um, it was unlike anything I had seen in El Salvador. And I was enchanted. I bought gifts, tablecloths, napkins, blouses, and wall hangings for friends and family. I was impressed by the amount of money flowing, especially the amount that I, the poor students, spent, and formed the impression that the indigenous Guatemalans didn't have it so bad. When I mentioned my impression to a professor, he was shocked at my ignorance and rattled off statistics about poverty, disease, and life expectancy among the indigenous Guatemalans. I had to admit that his argument had more weight than, than my naive impressions formed by haggling over the prices of craft in the market. Um, and that caused me to do a little research and to rethink my impressions. In 1980, I lived in Guatemala for about five months. I lived with a non-indigenous family while I studied Spanish and recuperated from hepatitis. Um, the family was lower middle class and glad to take in students. The man in the family ran a small bus company and the woman had a little store in the front of the house. 
and they were Latino. Um, they had an indigenous maid to do the heavy lifting around the house. Um, six days a week, the maid arrived by bus before I got up in the morning. The family's living room was only used to make guests uncomfortable. The sofa and upholstered chairs were covered in clear plastic. Um, when the women's relatives came, they sat in the, this posh living room. When the man's family came, they sat on folding chairs in the garage. They were indigenous and wore indigenous clothes. I didn't return to Guatemala for many years because of the genocide that began in the early 80s. Um, many groups called for international tourist boycotts, um, but I seemed to be the only boycotter. And while the Holocaust raged in the countryside, the generals and colonels kept the violence away from the tourist areas. Tourists continued to flock to Tikal and Chichi and Antigua, and I got sucked into the sanctuary. When I began interviewing indigenous Guatemalans in the 1980s and early 90s, I mostly asked about the war and wrote first person declarations or testimonies about massacres and flights through the mountains or jungle. I learned a little about indigenous houses and farming. Um, much of Guatemala is mountainous um, and the Cuchimatan range in the West it rises to over 12,000 feet elevation and gets very cold, especially at night. Um, and there are many small indigenous communities scattered in these rugged mountains and valleys. This area, the indigenous people call cold country. The Ishkan region in the northwest of Guatemala is a region of the jungle-covered hills. Um, it's called the hot country. It's much lower elevation. Um, the Ishkan was largely uninhabited, and beginning in the late 70s, some international organizations and liberation theology activists helped indigenous families settle in small communities there. Um, many worked cooperatively and sold their crops um, and goods um, through the co-ops. Well, naturally, this was viewed with great suspicion and anger by the, by the large landowners and the military. And of course, the Ishkan became the greatest, the area of the greatest number of massacres during the genocide. <clears throat> Most of the soldiers who carried out the genocide were themselves indigenous. The military forcibly recruited, um, well, um, I could say they were kidnapped, um, young indigenous men. In many communities, military commissioners gathered or pointed out boys who turned 18, the legal age for military service. However, they had quotas and weren't always fussy about details. I interviewed one Polti Maya who was grabbed when he was 13 because he was big for his age. Indigenous boys were beaten and tossed into military trucks and hauled off to the army base for basic training. And training was, was particularly brutal for indigenous recruits. Um, the trainers, the corporals and sergeants and lieutenants were all Ladino. Ladino with a D is a term indigenous people use for non-indigenous people. I use that term from now on. Um, the trainers insulted the indigenous recruits for being indigenous and beat them with special relish. Indigenous recruits were prohibited from speaking their native language and severely beaten or tortured if caught doing so. They were forced to do punishing exercises and punished when they couldn't go on. They were forced to drink um, dog's blood, ostensibly to make them brave and angry, and to eat raw dog meat. Um, they were forced to bathe in sewage. The trainers sometimes picked on one recruit, punishing him so severely that he died, in order to terrorize the other recruits, to make them work harder, to make them into soldiers who would obey orders and commit atrocities. Rape of the indigenous women and girls was common during the genocide. And in some areas, the Dinos continued to rape indigenous women and girls from very young ages with impunity. Just as white men raped black women and girls in our slave states long after the Civil War. Um, 
Professor Musalo, the director of the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies at Hastings, um, claims that rape was seen as a perk or benefit for Guatemalan soldiers. <clears throat> I don't know about a perk, but there is no question in my mind that rape was used as a weapon of war. In military service, traumatized many indigenous boys and men. Many committed horrible acts or saw horrible acts committed. Many were forced to abandon their culture and made to feel they were not part of the indigenous culture nor the Ladino culture. Um, in our civil war, um, Many Blacks were forced to serve in the Confederate Army, just as Indigenous, and, and fight against what was in their best interest. Just as the Indigenous people in Guatemala fought against their best interest. Um, military service for North American Blacks, beginning as far back as world, the World Wars and up until the present, has slowly and painfully helped educate Blacks and lift them out of extreme poverty. I don't mean to gloss over the racism in the U.S. military, but we have a number of black generals, and now we have a black man as our commander in chief. And um, I doubt very much that there are even any lowly lieutenants in the Guatemalan army who are indigenous. On a personal note, I had heard in the Deep South that blacks um, had to show deference to white people and even step off the sidewalk if a, black per black, if a white person approached. I couldn't help but notice that indigenous Guatemalans always walked behind me a pace or two when I invited them to the Cafe Milano in Berkeley for coffee and cake. Whenever I stopped and waited for them to catch up, they also stopped and waited for me to resume walking. I was the white man, the gringo, and they demonstrated due deference. The similarity between Blacks and Maya in this regard made me uncomfortable, but I got used to it and just walked on ahead, um, trusting that the clients would follow, which they always did. As in everything, I was very slow to realize the extent and manner racism affected education in Guatemala. I realized that many indigenous clients were illiterate, were illiterate are only marginally literate, um, but put that down to extreme poverty and, and the indigenous regions, as well as the war. Um, while not completely wrong, I was certainly not completely right. And little by little, I learned to ask indigenous refugees about their education experiences. Up until about 10 years ago, it seemed there were no indigenous teachers in Guatemala. Um, in remote villages, teachers, all the dinos, commuted every day or showed up on Monday mornings, stayed in a rented house during the week, and returned to their towns in the weekend. They were the only Ladinos in many of these villages. And the Ladino teachers seemed to be universally angry and yelled, scolded, and insulted the indigenous kids, calling them indios. That's Spanish for Indian, and that's a very a strong pejorative in Guatemala. Um, they called them burros and pigs. And the teachers told the indigenous kids they couldn't learn, or they were, they were useless, and they didn't belong in school. The teachers were frustrated because the students in the first few grades didn't speak much Spanish, um, if any, and, and took out their frustration on the kids. In all grades, they hit the kids with long, heavy um, wooden meter sticks, what we would call yard sticks here in North America. Um, they hit them on the palms of their hands, their knuckles, and on their fingertips, um, first making them put their fingertips together and holding them up. Um, that was particularly painful and often resulted in broken fingernails and bleeding fingers. Another favorite form of punishment was to make students kneel over dried grains of corn, small gravel, or bottle caps, first making the girls pull up their cortes and their skirts and the boys roll up their pant legs so that their knees were bare. Um, 
The victims had to remain kneeling for long, painful periods of time, sometimes holding books or stones in their upraised hands. The victims' knees always turned red and sometimes bled. And if they let the weights fall, the teachers whacked them with the rulers. In some remote areas, there were a handful of Ladino students in the school, and they were assigned seats in the front of the class, and the teachers concentrated on instructing them and generally ignored the indigenous students, except the punishment, of course. This is a sort of separate but equal um, system comparable to the U.S. And, and, and the, South. Um, the teachers did not publish, um, physically punish the Ladino students. Indigenous students were required to clean the school, the grounds, and the latrines, but not the Ladino students, never them. Uh, the teachers said that the indigenous students were only good for that, those kinds of chores. Um, it was also not uncommon for the Dino teachers to sexually abuse um, young indigenous girls, reaching down their blouses or up their skirts to grope them and even to rape them. The Dino students, when they were when there were the Dino students, also bullied indigenous students and did their best to generally make the education experience a real hell for the indigenous kids. Many indigenous students, unsurprisingly, did not do well in school. <clears throat> grade school runs from kindergarten through sixth grade and secondary or basico from seventh to ninth grade. A surprising number of refugees I interviewed had to repeat a year or two in grade school. Surprising to me because the people I talked to seemed intelligent. And after too long while, it finally dawned on me that the many indigenous kids were so terrorized that they cut classes and had trouble concentrating when they did go to class. Many dropped out before graduating. This racism in the Guatemalan education system is somewhat different or quite a bit different from that experienced by North American Blacks in our separate but, but certainly never equal um, um, system. Still, the results were the same. You deny your victim education, North American Black or Guatemalan Indigenous, and then you say he is stupid because he's not educated, he is not able to perform tasks um, that would qualify him for certain um, advanced jobs. Illiteracy was high among Blacks in the, in the post-Reconstruction South, which kept many working at slave wages on the plantations, and the literacy is still high among the indigenous Guatemalans. And a, a quick Google search will, will show you that the literacy among indigenous Guatemalan men is around 25%, and around indigenous Guatemalan women, about 48% which keeps them working at slave wages on the fingers. This is how racism works. Um, the situation is changing in Guatemala, no doubt, slowly and painfully. Um, some students persevere despite the abuse, and not all Ladino teachers are abusive. I have interviewed a number of indigenous people who persisted and got teacher certificates because they were motivated to teach their people. Um, they often endured years of racist persecution to achieve their dreams, only to find that the racism was so systemic they, that they often couldn't get hired or paid when they did get hired. Um, one indigenous woman told me a terrible story about some Latino teachers um, who murdered the supervisor, um, who was also Ladino, because he had replaced them for cause, of course, um, and, um, and hired this woman I interviewed and some other indigenous teachers. So the remedy was to murder the supervisor. Um, lack of opportunity and extreme poverty forces many indigenous girls and women to work as live-in maids for the Dino families, where they are often insulted and beaten by the women of the families and raped by the men. 
Um, it's exactly what happened to the black girls and women in the pre and post Civil War South. Um, and the national police um, beat, rape, and even kill indigenous people with impunity. Um, that is slowly changing in the U.S., where blacks are now in the police forces and sometimes even the chiefs. Um, <clears throat> Pardon me. I could go on and on, but let's get to the second part of this talk. Uh, the situation on our border. You'd be hard pressed to find someone in the U.S. who hasn't heard something about the thousands of refugees at the southern border. Um, talking heads spend, spend uh, innumerable hours, talking heads like me right now, innumerable hours debating what we should do. Um, the Make America White Again group thought that taking children from their parents and putting them in cages would terrorize many people into turning around or staying home. The compassionate people were appalled by this. Um, I'm in the second group. And I'm happy to see, this, you know, we're here in drought stricken California. Well, I'm happy to see a little drizzle after four years of compassion drought. Um, but compassion by itself doesn't solve the problem. I'm equally happy to hear this administration making references to the source of the problem. I believe that the problem at the border is only a symptom of the serious and often life-threatening disease in the Northern Triangle. And if there is to be a cure, we must treat the disease, not the symptom. Um, walls and cages failed and will fail again and again, as long as the violence, corruption, and poverty exist in those countries. It is in our own best interest to treat the disease, and we have a great deal of responsibility for causing the disease. The Northern Triangle countries suffered and continue to suffer tremendous hardship and violence as a result of our meddling. I won't repeat the statistics, on the Guatemalan dead and displaced. But I will say that little El Salvador, somewhere between Connecticut and New Jersey and land area, and nearly half of that land owned by the um, plantation owners, the ruling 14 families are called in El Salvador. Um, and with a population of 4.5 million when the Civil War began in 1980, suffered 75,000 dead, 8,000 forcibly disappeared, and 1 million displaced. That works out to nearly one-fourth of the population. Honduras is about the size of Virginia. In 1980, its population was under 4 million, about the current size of Oklahoma. Um, by 1920, Honduras' population had grown to nearly 10 million, or the size of Michigan. Now, I haven't interviewed nearly as many Hondurans as Guatemalans and Salvadorans, but enough to realize that the plantation system or latifundio system is alive and well powerful. In, in the last century, um, in the 1990s, I interviewed union activists who organized the workers on the enormous banana and plantain plantations. I also interviewed a number of Hondurans who had participated in what were called land invasions. A group of landless peasants would get together and file for title to unoccupied fellow land um, and then and claim title. And often they were often occupied before the titles were conferred. This was only somewhat legal um, because they were supposed to wait for the actual title, but the bureaucracy was pretty slow in, in doing granting the titles. The latifundistas were just displeased, so the plantation owners were displeased at the union activists and the land invaders and asked the security forces um, <clears throat> to, to take a look at the situation. And, you know, the security forces actually always do work for the uh, big landowners. So they looked at it and they resolved these encroachments with violence, including rape and murder. Um, which is they generally do. Honduras didn't have a civil war of its own, but um, 
became a staging ground for the U.S. back Contra War. Um, and the Contras made incursions into Nicaragua, as well as committed uh, many human rights abuses um, in, in Honduras. The U.S. has a long and inglorious history of meddling in the Northern Triangle. Tellingly, the military units responsible for the worst atrocities in those countries received the most support and training from the U.S. The Caibiles in Guatemala, the Atacado Battalion in El Salvador, and Battalion 316 in Honduras. Um, Battalion 316 also got some advanced training in, in the military in Pinochet's Chile. It's you know, hardly a sparkling recommendation for them. Um, Battalion 316, as well as G2 of the military intelligence in Guatemala and El Salvador, worked closely with our CIA and operated desk squads. One of the CIA's favorite Salvadoran officers was Roberto Dabuson, um, some who was nicknamed um, Blowtorch for obvious reasons. Um, he was reputed to have ordered the assassination of Monsignor Romero, now Saint Romero. Interestingly, people fleeing those groups, um, supported and trained by the U.S., were often eligible for asylum in the U.S. And also interesting, from the opposite point of view, is, is that um, anyone who served in those groups is assumed to be a persecutor of others and is therefore ineligible for any legal status in the United States. Um, so what we're saying is that um, the people that we supported and trained, we know that one part of our government knows anyway that they're human rights abusers. Um, and we don't want them here, but somehow they get here sometimes. All those dead, displaced, and disappeared are collateral damage in our Cold War with the Soviet Union. A contributing factor in Carter's loss to Reagan in 1980 with the revolution in Nicaragua, where a broad group of leftists and some centrists rose up against one of Latin America's most brutal dictators, Somoza. FDR is reputed to have said of Somoza, Somoza the father, that he may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. Um, whether apocryphal or true, the statement equally applies, applied to Somoza's son, who was overthrown by the Sandinistas in 1979. After he stopped being anybody's son of a bitch, our foreign policy gurus <coughs> worried about Soviet and Cuban inroads in Latin America, instituted what I call a support the sons of bitches foreign policy. Um, the ruling families, that is, the plantation owners or latifundistas, learned that they only had to cry communists and the U.S. would come running, money and weapons in hand. Carter had begun a human rights pro policy that prohibited the U.S. from sending arms and money to human rights abusers. That was not a problem for President Reagan. He had no qualms about perjuring himself when he signed white papers affirming that the Northern Triangle sons of bitches were improving their human rights record. And it wasn't a problem for the Democrats and Republicans in Congress who knew it was a lie. Um, they always voted to continue into military aid. Reagan also famously proclaimed um, that the Guatemalan sons of bitches were getting a bad rap on human rights issues. And that was, he said that at the height of the genocide. Um, the term fake news was not yet in vogue, but when he and his administration said that the reports of the El Mesote massacre, massacre in El Salvador were greatly exaggerated and attacked um, the reporters who wrote the story, and it was somewhat similar to what happens under a certain previous administration. Um, the war has ended in the last century, but the violence continues today. A few years ago, El Salvador was considered the most violent country in the world, with more violent deaths per year than in any year during the Civil War. And Guatemala wasn't far behind and has one of the highest femicide rates in the world. Um, 
our sons of bitches have evolved into politicians, no less corrupt, and many, many of them heavily involved in the drug trade, for which, by the way, the U.S., as the buyers and users, um, sure, shares a great deal of blame. Um, and there are the gangs. <clears throat> the gangs are made in the USA product we, that we exported to the Northern Triangle in the 1980s. Salvadorans fleeing the violence in their home country settled in the poor gang-ridden barrio in, L in L.A. And out of self-defense, um, Salvadoran teens formed their own gang, the Mara Sal Salatrucha, or MS-13, or simply 13. Some committed crimes and were arrested and deported to El Salvador, where they expanded. Currently, they and the rival of the Ocho, or 18 gang, have violently taken over much of the Northern Triangle, which they rule with violence. Um, and they're the cause of many refugees fleeing to the United States. Um, there was a very interesting artic article in the New York Review um, a few weeks ago that brought out the fact that these gangs are not the big money-making narco gangs with connections to the corrupt politicians that we support. These gangs are street gangs and they trade in drugs, but on a street level, and their main source of income is from extorting poor people. Um, they charge for rent to little shopkeepers and store owners um, who can't really afford to pay very much. Um, and citing other sources, the author of this New York Review article um, stated that if all of MS-13's take was equally distributed to their 40,000 um, members in El Salvador, it would come to $65 a month. So it would be a lot cheaper for the U.S. to match that amount or more in investments that would give gang members um, viable alternatives. Um, that seemed like a reasonable thing to me, but I understand that um, the problem to that solution is that our corrupt sons of bitches would not approve. Um, oh, by the way, one more thing about gangs is that they are also racist in Guatemala. Um, and while I give our current administration some compassion credit for its policy towards minors at the borders, I think telling desperate people not to come now is useless, um, if not ridiculous. Um, shouldn't we tell the gangs and state persecutors not to threaten or harm people there now? Shouldn't we um, take some action to get at the source of the disease? Um, or to put it in diplomatic terms, shouldn't we help clean up the mess that we helped make? Um, well, that's about all my voice can take for this morning. So um, I will turn it over to, for questions from Patrick. Work at the sanctuary changed based on changes in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm really having trouble hearing. I understand you said the work sanctuary has changed based on changes in Washington, D.C.? Yes. Does your work change based on what's going on in Washington? Um, yes. Um, you know, the, during the previous administration, there was a real effort to um, get rid of asylum, especially for people of color from certain countries. Um, and um, that's caused a lot of changes for us. And um, and there was this effort, well, there was this, um, this program to release unaccompanied minors. And um, there was a big um, wave of unaccompanied minors beginning in, 19, in 2014. And, um, and we formed part of a, a coalition or group to represent these unaccompanied minors before the Immigration Service. Um, and we started doing 100 and 150 of them a year. Um, <clears throat> um, that was in the Obama administration. They, the, the, uh, they were often not released, which was contrary to a, to a um, settlement agreement mm -hmm. during the Trump administration. But um, 
Yeah, in many ways, we're kind of at the mercy of, of um, the law, but then our government is also at the mercy of the law and has to obey the law. Um, here's another question. I seem to recall that Jeff Sessions did not consider domestic violence. Um, yeah, well, I, I think I got enough of that question from you to uh, c come up with an answer. Yeah, there was um, always this debate about domestic violence with the uh, patriarchs among us um, and, and, uh, and a lot of the very religious um, fundamentalists. Um, the United States was, was way behind Canada in recognizing domestic violence as a, as, a, as a nexus or a reason for getting asylum. And then when we did, um, a lot of people were upset by it. And um, so Jeff Sessions, um, he, um, you know, we started granting asylum at the end of the Clinton administration. But um, there was this famous case, a matter of a, a matter of, uh, um, well, I can't think of it right now, R.A. Um, but Jeff Sessions then took on another case of his own called matter of A.B. and um, tried to make it. He didn't. He couldn't say that he was going to deny asylum. or wanted the asylum offices and judges to deny asylum to all um, people claiming domestic violence or fleeing domestic violence. But he made it very difficult. Um, and um, so there were some lawsuits about that, and uh, and and that is pretty much enjoined right now. Okay. But as I say, this is the thing that the patriarchs um, don't like. They think that women should just um, stay and take the abuse and work it out, and, um, and it's a family matter. All right. All right. Uh, regular people, like uh, citizens in the United States, what can they do to help the immigrants, uh, both at the border and those are the United States? Um, well, that's a good question and a difficult question. Um, you know, money is always good for us and groups like the ACLU and other groups. Um, you know, we're also, um, like I say, we represent lots of minors at the border. Um, sometimes the minors need um, sponsors, um, people who would help them out or give them a place to stay. Um, um, and, um, you know, People can volunteer. Um, people can um, talk to their Congress people, put pressure on people, and and vote. Um, it's, it's, there's just lots of things you can do um, for us. Um, you know, sponsors, money, those kinds of things. Uh, and what other organizations with the help family? What other or? are here locally in the San Francisco Bay Area that are helping the families? Um, well, you know, we work with a number of them kind. Kids in Need of Defense um, is here. The Jewish Family Services is in the area. Catholic Charities. Um, no, just lots of groups. Um, I, I don't know. I guess you could just Google um, um, immigration nonprofits. And, and you okay. find, I don't know how many. Okay, and I think the next question, the, uh, the person who asked it was uh, alluding to post-traumatic stress disorder. The question is, do you see this with the impact of the violence they fled from, from their former countries? Yes. Um, okay, so I would say 75, 90% of our clients um, are traumatized, either post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, um, it's, it's just a tremendous amount of, of walking wounded, I call them. And we've been, we worked very hard to find therapists for them. And starting in 1996, um, under the Clinton administration, they passed a pretty restrictive immigration law. And part of it was that people had to file for asylum within their first year in the United States or show some compelling reason for not being able to do so, such as trauma as a result of torture. Um, and so that's what I based our statistics on. I would say that 75 to 90 percent of our clients for many years were over the one year deadline. And so we sent them um, to therapists um, 
all, the, all, the, all good people who wanted to help out. Um, and they diagnosed them as, with PTSD or major depression or some kind of disorder that would enable us to uh, apply for asylum for them. Um, um, right. You know, people like the indigenous Guatemalan, there's so much rape, um, you know, a girl raped by the military when she's 10 or 12, obviously she's traumatized and, and the trauma just doesn't go away. It very rarely goes away. You're a psychiatrist. You certainly understand this much, much um, more or much more thoroughly or much more in depth than I do. Yeah. Um, Psychologist. You see Claire. this amount of traumatized people. That's Mr. Smith, not a psychiatrist. So, um, oh, but sorry. thank you. I do, I do understand. And I have done evaluations uh, for your organization. And I think everyone I did the, had depression or post-traumatic stress. Yeah. So, I mean, we just see that automatically. We, you know, in our office, we can't, you know, we're not licensed medical professionals or mental health professionals. And we can't, um, can't really, um, um, diagnose, but we've learned through the years I mean, certain symptoms, and we see that there's just a really, really high percentage of people who are traumatized. All right, thank you. Well, you have time for one question, and I think it's a good one, actually. Uh, they've all, but this one's a good <clears throat> What do you think the Biden administration should start with first regarding the crisis? At regarding to see that. Do you like the Biden administration to start immediately? Um, well, I would like to see them God, <laughs> do, start with a lot of things immediately. Um, they could start um, with them um, working with the corruption down in the Northern Triangle. And they could start with the corruption along our own borders. Um, and, um, and as they have started a program, to reunite um, um, children who've been forcibly separated from their families. Um, um, okay. But, you know, this is just a mess. It's not going to be easy to, easy to deal with. A lot of the people at the border fleeing the gangs under U.S. law are not going to be eligible for asylum. Um, there's a big case from the 1990s, Nalia Zacharias, um, that's going to make them ineligible um, for asylum. So I don't know what's going to happen to those people. Um, okay, maybe, well, maybe another temporary protective status. That would be a good thing for um, people fleeing the gangs. All right. Thank you. Well, actually, I'm going to squeeze one last question in, Mr. Smith, before we call it a day. Um, do you see any changes in your work in the coming years? Um, well, Yes, I hope so, because in this past year, we've been working remotely. <laughs> um, and I hope that we can get back in the office. It's, it's pretty hard to be interviewing people and, and writing their testimonies um, by telephone or Zoom or whatever. Um, it's, it's just not as good. And, um, um, and um, I'm hoping, I don't know, that... that um, you know, we're lucky here in San Francisco. We deal with the San Francisco Asylum Office. They are, for the most part, excellent, very compassionate officers there. Um, and their directors and assistant directors are compassionate. Um, so um, if there are any changes, it'll be slow because of the bureaucracies coming down. Okay. But um, I think that um, we continue with domestic violence cases, you know, Currently, most of our cases now are LGBTQ cases, um, and um, I, I don't see that changing. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. You know, we're actually out of time. Um, we run out of time, so I want to thank you for the, your excellent presentation and thank the, the people who watch this for joining us, and uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful day today. Good night. Thank Goodbye. Thank you. Sure. Bye.